Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, joining the the, pod, uh, the webcast that we have today. Um, the webcast today is a follow-on uh, to a webcast that uh, uh, mainly John Michael put on uh, previously, uh, kind of a more of an introduction to EDSFF. Uh, today's uh, webcast is a, a follow-on to that to show what is happening, what is the latest that's happening with the specifications, what's going on in the industry, uh, and I guess with that, let's go ahead and meet the speakers. Uh, I'm Cameron Brett. I'm with uh, Kyoxia. I'm co-chair with John Michael of the uh, SNEA CMSI SSD SIG. And uh, my, John Michael, would you like to quickly introduce okay. yourself? Morning, guys. John Michael Hands. I'm at Chia Network uh, doing storage stuff. Uh, Cameron and I the uh, chairing of the SSD SIG. Um, so I, I used to be at Intel doing EDSFF and SSDs. So here we are. Okay. Uh, before we go any further, uh, we must, do, must uh, show the legal notice. Uh, this is uh, standard uh, information. Basically, the information is presented as is, no warranties, uh, use at your own risk, and please don't sue us. Uh, quick, uh, quick, Overview of what SNEA is and who CMSI is. SNEA is a is a very large industry organization that focuses on on storage and information technology. Uh, many leading industry leading organizations uh, are involved in the who develop IT products. Uh, contributing members uh, such as John Michael and myself. There's uh, over 2,500 of us. And the audience that we reach out to are over 50,000 of the I, uh, IT end users and storage pros. Uh, CMSI is the Compute Memory and Storage Initiative part of the, of the SNEA organization. Uh, we work, uh, since all these um, technologies tend to work together, um, this group uh, uh, works, uh, works together uh, in different special interest groups, uh, such as computational storage, persistent memory, uh, SSDs, and we evangelize these new technologies and how they well work together. Uh, so as part of the SSD SIG, uh, John Michael and I um, revamped the SSD form factors page, and you can see the uh, URL there, but also that QR code at the bottom of the page will also take you to this, uh, this page. Um, it is meant to be a, an industry resource and an authority on, on form factors uh, that uh, are defined by the various uh, industry associations and, and uh, standards bodies. Um, there is no official EDSFF uh, marketing uh, group uh, because they focus on the standards uh, development uh, but John Michael and I, as part of the SNEA SSD SIG, uh, decided that we would like to be the outlet and be the, the access point for EDSFF information. Uh, the, the Form Factors page uh, currently has a lot of EDSFF information. Uh, it has uh, webinar and session information from, uh, from FMS, from previous SNEA uh, webcasts, and some white papers. So this, uh, this is a living uh, page, and so it gets updated um, either monthly or, or bi-monthly basis. Uh, speaking of the uh, specifications, uh, this is uh, the latest versions of, this, of the various specifications uh, on the top. Uh, these are the uh, specs that uh, make up the E3 form factors, and down below you see the E1 form factor uh, specifications. Uh, there's a little bit of overlap as far as, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, standard pin and signal uh, definitions, uh, since they share that uh, common connector and um, electrical portion. So um, this is the latest as of today. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to John Michael. Yeah, so uh, one of the things we wanted to do today was kind of highlight all the excitement around EDSFF at the OCP Global Summit uh, that happened in San Jose uh, last month. 
So um, this was a presentation that was presented by a Anthony in the uh, Form Factor State of the Union, and the source of the data was from Trend Focus, but kind of showing this transition from these uh, original PCIe form factors. You know, M.2 kind of came from consumer devices like laptops, but it, they made their way into data centers through Microsoft and Facebook, kind of driving that hyperscale adoption. Um, so it's no secret that all that volume is going to go to even.s because all those, uh, all the new platforms uh, for those uh, hyperscalers are supporting e1.s. Uh, and the main reason they cited, obviously, M.2 didn't support hot plug. It didn't, uh, it wasn't uh, scalable to higher capacities and higher power envelopes and higher performance. And, uh, you know, the new factor on its best scales to PCIe Gen 5 and Gen 6. And so there's uh, obviously a lot of reasons driving the market demand, not just, hey, it's a new form factor. Um, there's all these other market growth uh, vectors that are kind of driving. Now, the, the E3 volume is really coming through this whole push from PCIe Gen 5, Gen 6, and then other device types supporting on E3. And we'll talk a little bit today about CXL and accelerators and SSDs and OCP NIC, everything on the same form factor, and that really driving uh, this E3 demand in 2U servers uh, for like enterprise OEM adoption. And so you kind of have coming from both angles, E1.S for like kind of compute, uh, high performance, um, you know, uh, storage for uh, like hyperscalers and then, and, uh, you know, servers. And then you have E1.L for kind of like capacity tier storage, like QLC. And you have E3 as kind of your general purpose, high performance NVMe for uh, OEM servers. And, uh, uh, Michael Smolin of uh, Solidime presented this one in his track, which uh, the, the data from Ford Insights, which is very similar, right? Which was, you know, by 2026, they're estimating about almost half the volume in exabytes, which is a massive amount, right? We're almost almost getting to about 500 exabytes in the SSD world. Um, you know, uh, uh, so half that being on EDSFF is, is pretty massive. And, you know, it could be more depending on how fast the uh, transition to PCIe Gen 5 goes. It's just kind of starting here. You know, there's, um, you know, both Intel and AMD were you know, kind of saying they're shipping this, the PCI Gen 5 systems, are, you know, early next year. And so that that really starts this whole process of getting these new platforms in, rotating them out, having customers try out EDSFF <laughs> Gen 5 backplanes. And, uh, but, you know, PCI Gen 5 is real, it doubles the bandwidth. And there's a lot of, uh, you know, reason of why you would want to move, move there from, from an SSD perspective. So, uh, so again, uh, if you go to the YouTube slash open compute, um, you'll see all the presentations. You can click on the little storage track playlist. You'll see all the all the sessions, uh, the form factor state of the union, uh, EDSF, uh, use cases and benefits. That was from Michael Smolin. Um, Poseidon, uh, that was from Samsung talking about the V1 of E2 Poseidon as the reference platform for EDSF. So there's a ton of great presentations on, on EDSF that were presented there. Uh, as well as other things. So there, there are, uh, Cameron mentioned, there's our, our few changes uh, in the specs. Well, this one is not a change, it was an, a brand new spec, right? It's this SFFTA uh, 1023. And this is really about how to measure the thermals in an EDSF device and platform. So not just looking at the device by itself and saying, oh, this thing takes 25 watts. Um, it's really looking at it in a platform with real thermal air curves and velocity and air approach and pressure and all the other things that matter, like in, in approach temperature uh, and then airflow. And um, so, it, you know, this kind of gives you recommended design space and then describes how to actually test this. Um, so if you're designing EDSF products, uh, this is definitely one to take a look at. Uh, the other exciting one are changes to E3. Uh, E3 is uh, the actual spec is SFFTA 1008. Uh, but, it, you know, the, um, let me grab my notes here. Uh, the, one of the biggest changes is, you know, this optional new uh, 4C plus connector. And if, if you that connector looks familiar, uh, this is the connector on OCP NIC. And so now you have a mechanical form factor and electrical connector and edge connector that would support uh, a NIC. So <clears throat> every standard network card, you support PCI Gen 5 SSDs, you support a CXL module for uh, memory attached storage. Uh, yeah. It's CXL attached memory or storage, and then you have, um, you know, and uh, accelerators like so computational storage, uh, smart AI stuff. Uh, sorry about the dog barking. If you guys can hear that. <laughs> uh, and then, yeah, the other change is this uh, primary one uh, C connector and adding an additional one uh, C on a like a, a 
uh, E3 thick device, and that's uh, a 2T. And that's going to allow for um, an option to do like a by eight connection if you want more bandwidth in a backplane system that has a bunch of by four connectors. And so this is going to be really useful. Uh, you know, most backplanes, even though these cards support different uh, PCIe interfaces like 4C you know, for by 16, 2C for by eight, 1C for by four. But, uh, you know, the idea is that you can actually have a backplane that supports a bunch of by fours. That's pretty common for SSDs because one SSD is designed for kind of PCIe Gen 4, sorry, PCIe Gen 5 by 4, four lanes of bandwidth. So this allows you to have eight lanes of bandwidth in this form factor and be backplane compatible. Uh, so with that, I'm going to pause it for a sec and play a little video. Hopefully this works of just uh, some footage I captured at the OCP Global Summit uh, of some vendors that have EDS in their booths. Um, those are just captured on my iPhone, so <laughs> nothing fancy, but... Uh, we thought we would just show a little clip of this before we dive into some of the systems that I saw and we're going to talk about. A 9.5 um, and at the other one is a 2.5. SMF products at the Foundry booth. Hello. Yeah, we love EDSMF. So E1.S 25 millimeter, E1.S 9. Big fatty. And this is the uh, PCIe Gen 5 one or uh, Gen 4? Gen 4 one. This is the Gen 4. <laughs> nice. EDSMF is, you know. All right, so I think everybody can see the slides again, hopefully. Uh, so that was fun. Uh, you know, I had a lot of fun walking around um, the OCP Summit floor and seeing all these EDSF products, uh, obviously, um, having been involved in trying to create all the specs and work with the industry to <laughs> make a ton of changes, to find the products, um, you know, to be at OCP this year and seeing them, you know, at pretty much every booth was just phenomenal. Um, so this is a fun one. Uh, this is Yosemite V3 uh, and with the Sierra Point E1.S 2OU flash blade and expansion board. Um, so these are all found uh, if you go to the OCP Open Compute uh, contributions. In the, you know, if you look at server specifications, these are contributed. So the really interesting thing about this Yosemite V3 is you know they, they have you can put these one U blades in or the two two um, you know two height, but you can fit three across. And this is a four OU open rack. Uh, it fits into open rack too, but uh, Meta can basically swap out these different modules and kind of mix and match a different amount of compute mm -hmm. and storage and networking for the different types of applications. So in, in the spec, they talk about support for you know, type three, type eight, type 15, type 17. So these are like the different database kind of things and different applications for their, their various services. But uh, they made this really modular and uh, really the highlight and star of the show is this, you know, six, E, uh, E1.S 25 millimeters said really good TCO because they don't have to have a ton of airflow. And, you know, the reason why they stressed 25 millimeter in this design was that, you know, they're packing uh, 1.5 kilowatts in, in a 4OU little chassis here with a bunch of different <clears throat> computers. So, uh, you know, you have to be really mindful of airflow and thermals and uh, storage density. So this, this was a really awesome one to see and they have a ton of different options. Um, and part of that spec was this standardization of the, uh, you know, I call it a latch. They're calling it a faceplate, um, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. Uh, but you know, something as simple as this, like a little mechanical latch, there's no reason that every company has to go reinvent it and, you know, to do, do their own design. And, um, and so having this kind of open sourced in the uh, OCP spec is really great for people that are making products and, you know, basically have something already to leverage. 
Um, and of course, one of the big selling points of EDSFF is it's all toolless. Um, you know, an EDSFF drive has the heatsink and the case and the, the latch and connector all in, in the drive itself. So you don't have to like go buy all this stuff or, you know, as somebody who's screwed in uh, a lot of caddies for, for drives and hard drives and SSDs, I can say, you know, the ADSF is going to be a you know huge step forward. <laughs> and then, you know, they have this uh, other version of this uh, flash blade, this uh, Vernal Falls, which uses the same drives. You can see the little expansion board here that has the four uh, ADSF connectors that go out to this uh, expansion board. So you can see, uh, you know, it's not just being used in you know, uh, one or two niche designs, it's, it's, this is being used in every single OCP design from these hyperscalers. Uh, this one is, is really interesting. Um, so I, I spent a lot of time, um, looking at this JBOD, you know, looking at total cost of ownership, uh, stuff, you know, the OCP just released the Grand Canyon specification in, uh, OCP contributions. And there's a lot of really interesting stuff in there, but one of the really ex interesting things in there is that, uh, they describe the different use cases for a warm storage config where you have more compute and you have more SSDs for caching versus hard drives. And, you know, they're, they're still using hard drives for warm storage. Uh, this is a Grand Canyon holds 72 hard drives. And then there's options for these two compute modules. And then they show the cold storage config where you have less compute and you daisy chain or cascade the JBODs and you get a high amount of storage. But in these warm storage applications, you know, you want more SSDs kind of near to the hard drives for caching. And so you can see now here on the bottom here, they have four SSDs to replace the um, you know, M.2s that were in the previous generation for the caching. And in, in the spec, they, they say, yeah, they use two terabyte drives uh, for the caching. Um, so this is again really cool that they, um, uh, not only is this in the Grand Canyon spec, but, um, you know, Facebook had written a, a paper about their tectonic file system that actually describes how all this works in practice. So not just actually open sourcing the hardware design, um, but actually the, the software showing how the software um, management at scale actually works all together. So uh, yeah, again, not just even for uh, SSD only configurations in database, this is, uh, you know, SSD is being used to cache a hard drive uh, server. And then, uh, uh, Samsung talked about Poseidon, and this is the open storage solution with E1.S, and this is the open reference design. This is more, they have uh, you know, two versions, one with compute and one as a JBOF. Uh, but then this is like super ultra high performance, you know, 32 E1.S across the front of a 1U chassis. So this is just ultimate max performance. Um, as many people know, with you know, U.2, you can get to a maximum of about 10 drives in a 1U, maybe 12 if you're getting pretty nuts. Uh, and um, yeah, this is a huge benefit to as far as performance in I/O, you know, especially for two socket systems that have a lot of PCIe connectivity. You know, you, you actually now have a way to use that and scale the performance. You can scale a lot of smaller capacity drives and get max performance for some kind of like application like disaggregated storage. So again, uh, these are all uh, one of my favorite parts about OCP uh, contributions is that they're actually just open. You can go to OCP contributions and take a look at the website. Um, so we saw um, this, the Microsoft platforms, they I don't, I don't, they didn't show off the E1.S, but this was the old one that used the uh, 18 millimeter E1.L. Uh, they have since moved on to nine and a half millimeter E1.L, and that's kind of standard for high capacity QLC designs. But compared to, um, you know, U.2 in, in a, a high capacity design for like a JBOF or for dense storage applications, E1.L just off better, you know, uh, better capacity, better utilization and uh, thermals versus U.2. And so that's really important if you're looking at a application where you want to fit the maximum amount of storage in the smallest amount of space possible, E1.L is, is always going to be superior. So this is the, the uh, Microsoft Compute Node, and uh, you can see here the, you know, the, the PCIe Gen 5 uh, uh, and uh, new CPU routes out to these eight and the drives aren't shown here, but I believe it supports the 15 millimeter E1.S. Uh, and these are all PCIe Gen 5 slots. And so the, the really interesting thing about this is it's not like a, it's not a specialty high end, um, you know, server. This is like the standard node for scale out for high volume servers uh, for compute nodes. So this is, um, yeah, so this was shown at the Microsoft booth. Uh, this was, yeah, again, really, really awesome to see. E1.S be kind of the star of the show front and center here with the OCP NICs in this 
uh, high volume compute server. Uh, and there's a bunch of others. I, I wish I actually grabbed pictures of some of the other hyperscale ones. I grabbed uh, this was for ASRock, but um, yeah, there was like, uh, it seemed like almost every single booth had an EDSPF <laughs> uh, server, which as you saw from the volume, when you know it's gonna be hundreds of exabytes here in a few years, uh, that makes total sense why all these server manufacturers and hyperscale uh, vendors would be supporting this form factor. And again, the really, um, there's a, a lot of variants of different options, capacities, uh, one U, two U between E1.S and E3. And uh, e, uh, OCP really highlighted and showed off a lot of the flexibility that system designers have in designing this these platforms. So with that, uh, I am gonna turn it over to Cameron to talk about some of the OEM stuff we saw and uh, some of the designs for E3 enabling uh, you know, two U type servers. Okay, uh, thanks, John Michael. Uh, just a, uh, a note that uh, if you have questions, go ahead and uh, type them in, uh, I guess, in the questions or the chat box. And then uh, at the end of the uh, pre uh, webcast here, John Michael and I uh, will try to tackle as many as we can. Uh, so um, this is called OEM, uh, but you know, I, th I think most of the material here or all the material that John Michael has been covering uh, is from OCP and there's a, a lot of great information. Uh, and a lot of great activity. Um, and really most of that was focused around uh, E1.S. But what I wanted to do was touch on some of the different kind of more traditional uh, system makers, uh, ser uh, server and storage uh, makers on what, what they have going on uh, in E3 uh, and, as well as E1.S. Uh, so th this is, a, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, this is a prototype uh, from a couple of years ago that this was uh, made available. We're uh, trying to get some updated information, uh, but we're not to get, able to get it in time. Uh, but as you can see, uh, there's uh, many, many uh, E3.S uh, drives. These are just standard height, not the 2T uh, Z height. Um, so this one is uh, from, uh, from Dell. Uh, and, and just a note uh, as well uh, is that, you know, the, I guess most of the, uh, the traditional server and storage guys, as well as the hyperscale guys, you know, are on board with both uh, e, E1 and, and E3 uh, form factors of drives. Uh, it's not like, you know, one prefers one or the other. Um, just uh, one touch about E3, uh, as, as I think we've noted in the previous uh, webcast, uh, is that that's really, you know, definitely, it's definitely a replacement for the traditional two and a half inch form factor, which was originally designed around uh, hard drive technology. And so this will definitely get you a lot more density, a lot more performance, uh, and of course, better thermals and airflow and uh, heat management. Uh, on the HPE side, the, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, another one of the, the major server storage uh, manufacturers uh, you know, this is all public information. Uh, we're not um, saying anything that has not been uh, shown before, uh, but in the webcast here, we're, you know, hoping that to provide a nice consolidated uh, uh, pieces of information um, that shows the momentum that uh, EDSFF is gaining. Uh, the DL, uh, in, in this slide here, the, the DL 325 as well, the, the 345, uh, they have uh, backplane options uh, that'll give you, you know, your traditional hard drive and SSD, you know, uh, three and a half inch large form factor uh, type of backplane, as well as, uh, you know, a larger number of two and a half inch drives. But uh, what you can you can also see there that they do uh, both support um, backplanes with uh, EDSFF. And of course, you know, if you're in a one U, you'll you, you'll support. I think this one supports uh, 20. Uh, EDSFF devices and the 345 uh, will support a very nice number of 36. Um, uh, down at the down at the bottom there, the uh, the edge storage density accelerator cloud optimized. Uh, you know th those are uh, more kind of configurations uh, that uh, that can be used with the DL 325, 345, and others um, to that utilize um, the E3. Uh, form factor drive. And I think there's also, 
uh, support for uh, CXL, which uh, is, is also gaining uh, momentum um, in the server and storage space. Uh, Lenovo uh, has uh, has an option here. They uh, they're they're talking about their uh, AnyBay, which is a, a, a tri mode uh, support for SaaS, SATA, and NVMe. And in the in the third one down is where you'll see some of the EDSFF uh, drive bays that's a, that support hot swap uh, up to sixteen drives. Where traditionally in in that form factor, you could maybe maybe support ten. And then, of course, um, uh, down at the bottom there, the large form factor uh, options. Uh, Inspur here, uh, they have uh, public information uh, about um, EDSFF uh, uh, configurations that also uh, include CXL and computational storage. Um, so the, these are all kind of E3 uh, form factor based. And th those are the those are the major kind of like system and, and storage uh, vendors uh, that are have either announced or made publicly available information uh, about their platforms. And now, uh, of course, you all these systems need um, SSDs and SSD vendor support uh, to, to populate those drives. And since I'm from Kyokushu. I'll touch on the first one here. Uh, John Michael took this picture from uh, from OCP, uh, and as you can see in the very front there, we have uh, a number of we have four different uh, uh, E1.S, and that's re really uh, across uh, two generations of uh, E1.S uh, SSDs uh, that support uh, Gen 4, and will be supporting uh, PCIe uh, 5.0 as well. Uh, on the far right and in the back, uh, the back row uh, with the orange label are the uh, E3.S uh, variants and again uh, supporting PCI 4.0 and 5.0. Uh, what's not seen in the case here but happened to be in the back wall um, is uh, an E1.L sample of uh, software enabled flash module which is kind of a different technology but utilizes the industry standard uh, E1.L uh, form factor. And I think with, uh, with that, uh, turn it back over to John Michael. Awesome. Yeah. So I'm just going to highlight again, some of the uh, vendors that were showing off EDSF in their booths. <clears throat> so uh, all that I was showing uh, E1.L, the QLC, the P5316, and then showing uh, the P5520, the D7, these are the TLC drives that go from uh, 1.92 to 7.68 terabytes. And they have, they were showing the nine and a half and 15 millimeter versions. Uh, and then they're showing the P5520. So they do have a TLC in this E1.L app. And these products are near and dear to my heart because uh, I, I worked on the, the product, the original product family with this controller. So, so I, I know, know quite a bit about the architecture. Uh, and so this is a really you know, power efficient and high performance Gen 4. So it's awesome to see this, this uh, you know, this type of uh, product in an E1.S factor like this. So you know, the, the whole selling point was like you get U.2 performance in a smaller form factor. And as we showed in some of these server configurations where you can fit, you know, the two drives in the front of a one U, that's just insane, mind blowing performance. Um, and then the exciting thing is they showed this, they showed this future 192 layer QLC uh, that goes up to 30 terabytes in, in E3.S 7.5 millimeters, uh, just the standard E3.S. And so that's really exciting uh, to basically have that much 30 terabytes in this really small form factor that can enable, you know, standard 2U servers to have high capacity QLC. Uh, and they, I think they'd have made some announcements on these products, uh, you know, since the OCP summit. So again, really awesome sh showing the full breadth of the portfolio here. And then uh, SK Hynix uh, was showing off a bunch of their E1 uh, products and E3 products in, in the booth. Mm -hmm. So they, not only did they show off the SSD, so they have the PE9110 um, in a bunch of different various form factors, but you can see they actually have the E3 as well. And they have this on the top letter, this uh, CXL 2.0 PCIe Gen 5. Uh, platform so with the, the memory so not only do they have um you know ssd products uh, they also have memory products <coughs> excuse me 
which I, you know, I think is, uh, again, uh, as you saw from uh, that slide that uh, camera showed on Inspur and the other OEM systems, you know, I think that was the ultimate goal. You know, when you hear about like 20 E1, uh, sorry, 20 E3 in a 1U server, you're like, that's that's a lot of storage. Most people don't need you know, 20 drives in a 1U, it's performance. But the idea of you can mix and match accelerators and memory and expander, it's TXL memory modules and everything in these slots, um, they're basically priming the pump for the system in this world where everything is interoperable. And, you know, EDSFF is kind of the, EDSFF on top of PCI Express is kind of the backbone of this, of these systems. Uh, so yeah, again, super awesome to see all the products from SK here. Um, you know, on, uh, I, I feel bad because, uh, you know, this is the only shot I took. Uh, I snapped this from that video I took in the uh, Samsung booth. Uh, it was pretty busy when I went in there the first day. Everybody was walking around. Uh, but they had a bunch of different stuff. So they showed off a CXL memory module. They, I think they have a, they said 512 gigabytes of DRAM in a CXL you know, E3 form factor. Um, they were showing these drives on the top here, the PM983 E1.S, and then you know, the drives on the bottom, the E3.S. Uh, that was PM 1743, PCIe Gen 5 drive um, and that was kind of one of the first gen 5 drives announced and i do believe um you know there's some some of those floating around in <laughs> some reviews benchmarks online uh, and so but again um you know somebody like samsung and sk that make memory and storage it makes total sense to have a form factor that supports all these different interface types of cxl and pci express and then having different device types like ssds accelerators and memory on CXL, it's just an amazing, amazing feat. So, um, yeah, to say we've come, you know, this far, uh, again, again, we're also showing off Poseidon, and um, I didn't, unfortunately, I didn't snap a picture of that, but I just showed kind of a, uh, a little picture earlier of what the server looks like. But they have the the one U that has thirty two E one S and one U, and then they have the two uh, U chassis that supports the E threes, and showing the kind of mix and matching of all the device types. Uh, and uh, if you saw in the video, um, I, I don't think I had a slide on it, but uh, Fadu uh, was there. Um, there was a ton of other, I think uh, Insys had a platform I show. It was, you kind of saw a glimpse of it in the video. Uh, this, um, they had a 1U platform that supported like two 400 watt TDP CPUs that were water cooled and a bunch of E1.S on the side. So I, I mean, I just saw so many awesome Cool designs. I, as a server geek, I'm just drooling over all these <laughs> insanely high performance uh, systems. Uh, so uh, yeah, I can't wait to get my hands on them. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Any other any other comments, uh, John Michael? Before we get to uh, questions. No, I think we can hop okay. over a few questions. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Today today's uh, webinar is was not really meant to provide any kind of educational background information on EDSFF. We have that uh, uh, that in initial webinar back from 2020 that really goes into a lot of great detail. Uh, and there's a lot of great information on the SSD form factors page on, on EDSFF E1 and E3. So for for educational kind of uh, what is it type of information that that's that there's plenty of great information. Uh, this was kind of an update on where things are at with the specifications and kind of market activity and market projections. And it seems pretty clear that uh, EDSFF is going to be um, going to be replacing the, the M.2 and two and a half inch uh, form factors uh, pretty quickly once they start becoming available. Uh, OK, uh, if uh, if anybody does have questions, please uh, go ahead and uh, um, enter them in, into the into the chat box. And I think we have we have a few of them right now. Um, let's see the 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 short one here, which I think we we can uh, probably take pretty quickly is what does the EDSFF roadmap uh, look like? Um, quite honestly, I have not seen an EDSFF roadmap, um, but I think once the form factors uh, are out in the market, um, there will be kind of features and and. Uh, Kind of smaller additions uh, to the to the existing uh, form factor specifications, you know, like uh, ones that John Michael touched on around 1008 and 1023, and um, so yeah, like the the changes in the other other tiny changes to the spec are like 
looking at slot power, um, you know, defining some LED stuff, some minor cleanup. But, you know, really the spec is pretty mature as far as, you know, we've, we've seen the, a lot of validation and support on the connector and especially at higher interface speeds. So that's, that looks great. Um, you know, now you have actual platforms and backplanes and chassis that support these form factors. So that it's going to kind of mature a bit into where at least the mechanical stuff, I mean, hopefully doesn't have to change too much. No, I think there are some things going to look at other, even more device types like GPUs of how you get something in like a EDSFS like form factor. But, um, as far as devices itself, um, I mentioned, uh, both uh, AMD and Intel have, you know, PCIe Gen 5, you know, Sapphire Rack in January are coming out and shipping in Q1, and they're going to have everybody, every vendor that's supporting those platforms, as you saw, is basically designing EDSFF in because it, it is superior to, you know, U.2 and other form factors of Gen 5 and beyond. So it's, um, yeah, we, we've already seen E1. E1.L and E1.S devices. You can literally go to eBay right now and buy one. So those are out, <laughs> um, you know, you know, uh, E3, I don't know if you can, you know, exactly go to the store and buy a, you know, an E3 yet, but uh, you will be very soon in some of these server configs here early next year. So coming to a Best Buy near you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so continue on with that uh, question about Gen 5 versions of, uh, of, of these uh, SSDs. You know, there's some products that are announced, uh, even from my company, Kyoxia. Um, uh, there have some been uh, PCIe 5.0, uh, E3, uh, and potentially E1.S uh, announced. Uh, John Michael, I, I'm, I'm not sure about the CXL. Uh, I, I think it, um, I don't have any thoughts or comments on the CXL portion of that question. Um, yeah, I mean, we saw, we definitely saw like, announcements from Samsung and you saw just that the, the, some of the pictures I showed showing prototype devices, um, you know, for the CXL two. So when, you know, when that ships on a CPU, I think you'll see there are going to be device vendors ready, ready to ship. So uh, I, obviously the CXL has bit, got even more buzz, you know, than you know, as, or as much as EDSFF CXL is a huge, huge, momentum behind it. So having that form factor be kind of the vehicle for CXL, um, it's going to be huge for EDSFF. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. This one's a little bit long, but I'll read it real quick. Um, I'm looking for some thoughts on recent comment I read about PCIe 5 uh, NVMe drives likely needing or benefiting from larger form factor like the, the 25 millimeter uh, versus 22. Uh, for cooling considerations with map mark, mass market price adopt, uh, optimizations, what is the likelihood <coughs> excuse me, uh, that CLI compute will need to transition away from existing M.2 uh, form factors in, in the coming years? And will that be shared form, form factor? Will that be a shared form factor with server compute, as has well, been the case with five and a quarter, three and a half, and two and a half? <laughs> Well, I can say this. I don't work at Intel anymore, but when I was there, I advocated for the desktop workstation groups to adopt EDSFF and put them on the reference platforms and kind of convince OEM and motherboard makers. Uh, I'm sitting here at like, you know, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus here, but I, you know, I have a very expensive workstation uh, from uh, one of these OEMs and the enterprise storage support is just not there, right? They use like M.2 devices on little carrier cards and there's no cooling on these things. Like they're just stuffed in a desktop. You know, storage kind of took a back burner on these high-end systems. And now, uh, now that we have these new form factors, um, you know, it gives uh, motherboard vendors and system builders, you know, kind of more options, right? Like my opinion is that a, my opinion is that a you know fifteen twenty thousand dollar workstation needs like enterprise type drives. They don't need a consumer type drive. So having e just tough support, especially for Gen Five, makes sense. Um, in the uh, form factor state of the union in the uh, OCP, they talk a little bit about Gen 5 specs, you know, being discussed for uh, U.2 and uh, M.2. There are not many, and so literally, there are, there are desktop motherboards today that ship an M.2 PCI Gen 5 slot, but the specs not done. <laughs> it's not like you know, uh, you know, will, how many devices will this work with, and is M.2 really the right form factor for Gen 5? Well, no. As soon as you get to like you know, seven or eight, you know, gigabytes a second 
you know, right bandwidth with today's performance per watt on NAND flash, you know, you're consuming a, a lot more power than M.2 can, mm -hmm. can suck up. So at some point, they're just going to say, if you want more performance, you're going to need to move to a different form factor. And I, I think it totally makes sense in, especially in desktops and servers where you have a 300 or 400 watt GPU, you know, the SSD being eight watts versus 15 watts, like that seems like a, a reasonable thing. So uh, I'll get off the soapbox now. Yeah, I can't wait <laughs> to see you just start consumer and desktop. I want, I want to use it. Uh, <laughs> nobody's made it yet, uh, but I'm, I'm ready for when that happens. <laughs> All right, we got a couple more. Uh, let's see on the E1 versus E3S market dominance. Can you, <clears throat> excuse me, refer to the support of dual port modules? Some traditional server storage designs favor E3 because of the dual port configuration. More modern storage designs do not rely on dual port modules uh, like replication. Um, and therefore prefer uh, E1.S. Do you agree with this correlation? And how does this affect um, predictions on market share? Wow. Yeah, there there is some confusion about the specification support versus what vendors support and what customers are demanding. Like, so the EDS specs share a common pinout and connect specification. So the uh, you know the actual EDS specifications for the uh, pinout and um, which, uh, let's, man, I got to remember now, TA-1012. Uh, so uh, EDSF natively supports dual port. So if somebody wanted to make E1.S, for instance, it supports the dual port functionality, they totally could. Now, what you're saying practically is we saw some hyperscalers kind of using E1.S and <laughs> compute designs and, um, you know, maybe the, uh, the the vendors that are using dual port high availability systems today use U.2 in dual port mode. Um, will those go to E3? Most likely, right? And because we, we just saw the reasons why the other things are going to E3. Um, you know, will we see dual port support for smaller devices? If a vendor wants to make one, they certainly can. Uh, there's nothing precluding them from doing that. But um, it's really about the people that make these high availability enterprise uh, storage base, which Dell EMC and NetApp and other guys like, what are they going to drive the SSD vendors to go build for them to go support? So, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, it was it was interesting um, also uh, that one of the I think it was uh, Forward Insights had the prediction showing, you know, larger numbers of E3 uh, kind of further out in time, because I think that's just more of a transition away from two and a half inch to, to E3 is is a pretty, um, I guess, a pretty easy move. I guess once the, the server and storage OEMs uh, transition there. Their back planes. Uh, okay, and then uh, I think we have one more question. Uh, have you investigated enabling conduction cooling of E1 and E3 to a water-cooled cold plate? If not, is it of interest? <laughs> um, I, I, I think you saw in um, there there was a slide uh, a presentation from Mohan at Intel at OC about immersion cooling. Um, there's a lot of focus there on the sustainability aspect as you can get your PUE down even farther by, you know, reducing, basically eliminating the fans and system design and, you know, increasing the cooling, getting higher TDP devices. Um, so there is a lot of interest in this. Um, you know, I, I think that last time we had talked about it, I don't think there's anything in the spec that would make it like not okay for immersion cooling, but um, the kind of heat plate or cold plate kind of sounds cool if you had a, if you saw some of those new CPU, you know, they have the heat pipes on them, piping away to a different fan. You know, these things, CPUs are just getting so hot now. So you're going to have the same kind of thing if you have a bunch of like, you know, you, know, you saw that you know, uh, OEM design. I think um, they basically, uh, the HPE one said up to 36 drives in 2U chassis. If each one of those are 15 watts, it's a lot of power in the front. And so that there, there are... Um, a lot of discussions about how do you cool a system like that. And I think as we mature, you know, you'll see a lot more designs like that. Uh, but yeah, I, I haven't seen any personally today, but I, yeah, I know, I know a lot of people are talking about immersion cooling in data center. So. Yeah. Well, I guess we'll see how the, the, the heat sink uh, options, you know, I mean, you know, I guess if, uh, you know, they, they, the E1.S has the heat sink options for, you know, to, for, I guess, to help with the cooling, uh, lower CFM. Um, but um, I'm not sure about the, we'll see how water cooled cold plate. 
I, I'm not familiar with that one though. Okay, uh, I think that's it for the for the questions that we had in the in the in the box. Uh, first off, uh, thanks for for joining us today. Uh, this will be available um, you know, on demand for you know for future, and then you know, hopefully once uh, more market momentum and more products uh, and kind of applications and usage of EDSFF drives and systems uh, comes out, then we can do a follow up on this. Uh, so uh, as as usual, please rate the forecast. Uh, the webcast. <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, here are some more resources, uh, you know, from SNIA and the CMSI. Um, please check out some of the other content. And thank you very much. Uh, John Michael, any closing comments? Yeah, just a reminder to, you know, if you want to learn more about the form factors, you know, the specs are all up there on the SNIA website. Um, the form factors page will point you to everything. Or you can just go you know, Google SNEA SFF, you'll find them. Um, and then I mentioned that you will send some links out there to the OCP um, videos, uh, which you know, there's a ton of good presentations on a lot of the questions people are asking about kind of what, what the future looks like in this space. And uh, it's very clear uh, a lot of all the companies are very excited about this because of all the new applications and system designs it enables. So, Okay. Uh, thanks again for joining and uh, have a good day. All right. Thank you bye guys bye. so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.